So for this lesson we're going to be looking at transformations of trigonometric functions and as we've done many many times through this course and through previous courses all functions in general can be described through the transformations coming from the parameters a, k, p, and q and the function itself the only difference that each function makes is how you express it when you actually consider the function itself. So for example in this case if I say that my function f of x is equal to sine x then that's going to define for me where the a, k, p, and q go. But the actual the actual transformations themselves don't change from the a, k, p, and q that you're already familiar with. So then the question becomes okay how am I going to apply these to the various functions? Now in order to do that you do need to be familiar with the parent functions for each of these. Now in the case of sine that should be something that's well familiar. In all likelihood you know sine from uh, starting from zero you might know that's a really awful representation of sine. Starting from zero you might know one full cycle that way and it's helpful to also of course be able to work backwards from there. If we look at cosine, the parent function for cosine starting from zero starts at a maximum so it looks like that to the right and then a reflection to the left. And then if we're going to do tangent, the reason why I suggest that you f be able to represent a cycle both forward and backward is because tangent is actually sine over cos. So if it's sine over cos, the important part about the divided by cos means that wherever cosine has a zero, tangent is going to have a vertical asymptote. And wherever sine is a zero, tangent is going to have a zero. So in this case, for example, and then you can take a look and figure out positives and negatives. So for example, at pi by two, which I haven't drawn vertically very well, but we have both sine and cosine are positive. So that tells me tangent's going to look like that. And then to negative pi by two, which is here and here, we've got negative for sine and positive for cosine. So we're going to have negative over a positive, which looks like that. And then this pattern actually just repeats itself. So you do need to be able to work these things out, but as you can see, even what I did there, it didn't take particularly long. So, and I do say that here. So if we're going to graph this, we want to do this based on key points. So I'm going to try to space this out a little bit better this time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put 2 pi over here, and I'm going to try to line that up down here, 2 pi. And then I break that up, so there's pi and about the same space, negative 2 pi here, and I'll try to vertically line that up, negative 2 pi. And then halfway is negative pi, and that puts negative pi there. And then I won't label these, but there is pi by 2, there's 3 pi by 2, negative pi by 2, negative 3 pi by 2. And the same thing here, I'll break those up and divide that in half and divide that in half. Okay, so now that I've done that, if we're using sine and cosine, then we should, we know that it varies between 1 and negative 1. And for sine, <clears throat> excuse me, for sine, I think what I'll do is I will work in red for sine. So sine starts at 0, 0 and then it goes to a maximum at pi by 2, back to 0 for pi, a minimum for 3 pi by 2, and then to 2 pi. And I could work this backwards as well, just repeating that pattern. And then I try to put in a nice smooth sinusoidal curve. Now I'll switch over to green to show cosine. Cosine we know starts at a maximum of 1, and then to 0, then to negative 1, back to 1, and to positive 1. And going to, to the left, same idea, to 0, 
to negative 1 to 0 to positive 1. So a quick sketch of those two curves. I just wanted to show this with a slightly better scale because now for my tangent I'm going to cycle between the two vertical asymptotes and those occur where cosine is equal to 0. So cosine is equal to 0 at negative pi by 2 which gives me one of my vertical asymptotes at x or let's say um, yes I'll say x simply because I have x written down here. So this is x equals negative pi by 2. And then I have another one here at x equals positive pi by 2. And between here, my sine value is equal to 0 here at 0, 0. And so as I described before, both sine and cosine are positive between 0 and pi by 2. So positive over positive is positive. Sine is negative, but cosine is positive, so negative over positive means this one is negative. And then this, you notice the width of this from negative pi by 2 to positive pi by 2 is pi wide, so the next vertical asymptote will be pi away. And of course that also matches with cosine being equal to 0 here, and so we end up with something that looks like that. And if I put on another vertical asymptote, and this cycle continues to repeat as well. The only thing to notice there is that, or the, a really important thing to point out, is that up here for sine and cosine, the period is equal to 2 pi, whereas for tangent, the period is equal to pi. And that's just because of the way that tangent is defined as sine over cos. Once I can identify some of these key points, then the next thing I need to do is to um, transform those points according to my values for a, k, p, and q. And the easiest way to do that is with this relation. x, y turns into x over k plus p, a, y plus q. The next thing to talk about and I've, you can notice that I've marked here something that I brought up on the previous slide. Uh, first of all, the A value, that's a vertical reflection and amplitude. Your K value has your horizontal reflection, if it's positive or negative, and then the period. And I already mentioned this on the previous, which is that sine and cosine have a period of 2 pi. So that means any transformations have to be done to the period of 2 pi. Tangent has a period of pi, and so your transformation applies to that. And it's also worth noting here that cosecant and secant have the same period as sine and cosine, whereas tangent and cotangent have a period of pi. The phase shift, that's how much my graph, is, my graph has been shifted to the left or right. And the reason why we use the letter P and the reason why we refer to this word phase is because of trigonometry. It has to do with the idea of the unit circle. That's something I'll maybe talk about in a, uh, another lesson or something we'll talk about in class. And then Q, the axis of the curve, that's the horizontal line that forms the center of the curve. So for example, here for sine and cosine, for the parent function, the axis of the curve is y equals 0, just this horizontal line that is the x-axis. Now, always the most difficult part when we talk about transformations is working backwards. It's a relatively simple process to start with a transformed function and come up with the graph. Because at the very least, you could just put in x and x values and come up with y values. You could use a table of values. That's a crude way of doing it. It's not very time efficient, but in a pinch, that would get you through. The other direction is more difficult, which is what if I give you a graph or a table of values that you could visualize as a graph and then ask you to work backwards and tell me what the transformed equation is. The first thing you need to do is to select the parent function. Now, if it's tangent, that's going to be quite distinct. Sine and cosine, on the other hand, they're the same as each other other than a phase shift. 
So that's the first thing to understand is that you might get a different choice for sine or cosine. Both may be legitimate. We're going to look at the graph that we have. I'm going to assume we've got a picture of this. And we identify key properties of period, which is we look for repeating. So we look for repeating cycles. I didn't get written out very well. We look for repeating cycles. in order to identify the period and then the axis of the curve that's going to be the line through the middle and these two things are for a, for a trigonometric function these are actually usually pretty easy things to pick off of your graph and so once you do that you are going to be able to identify your k and q values and just to go back just to remind you as far as finding that k value once you've got the period of sine and cosine you plug it in here and you find solve for k once you have the, t the period of a tangent then you put it here and you solve for k the p va the q value i'm sorry the q value is something you're probably going to be able to read just directly off the graph once you have the q value the amplitude is defined in terms of the q value because once you have your q value your axis of the curve your amplitude is actually let's call that that's your absolute value of your amplitude is how far you are above or below the axis of the curve so once you've got that now you know your amplitude and then your phase value or your phase shift that's where the curve is starting and so what you're basically saying is how far left or right have I shifted from the parent function to some extent your choice of P is also going to dictate your sine of a it's not a bad idea to choose your phase shift so that your a value is positive but some phase shifts it just makes sense to choose a convenient phase shift and then make your amplitude negative and then once you have your values a, k, p, and q, then you go ahead and write out your equation. Remember, there be multiple. There could be multiple answers that represent the same graph. Multiple combinations of a. Uh, let's see what could change. The sine of a could be different. The value of p could be greatly different, and the sine of k could also be different. So there can other things. Q, for example, can't change. The magnitude of A can't change. The magnitude of K can't change. The other thing to keep in mind is that even whether it's a sine or cosine could be a little bit different. And so there's nothing like some practice to go ahead and work on this. Uh, normally I would provide a worked example for this, especially for step three, but this is really all review material. The only thing that's new about this lesson is the fact that it's using radians instead of degrees. So I'm hoping people will be able to dive into this with some amount of success.